Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, today we're going to talk, so I will just give you an outline of what we're going to talk about. We'll start by talking about data. Right, it's shocking. Um, then we'll, oh, excellent. Um, in particular, we're going to go through the why, how, and what of low rank approximations of data. The answer to what, or kind of who, is going to turn out to be truncated singular value decomposition. Uh, to understand what that means, we're going to take a deep dive and uh, actually introduce singular value decomposition and PCA. We'll discuss it, the pros and cons. And the cons are going to motivate us to introduce an alternative low rank approximation technique called NMF, non-negative matrix factorization. In turn, we'll discuss its pros and cons. And Dylan's talk, the main talk of today, is going to discuss how to handle some of these cons. And then we'll have a, a brief history of the use of NMF and uh, why we like it so much in biology. Okay, starting with data. What do we mean? We mean, uh, well, notationally, we mean some capital X, a matrix that has N rows, the samples, and M columns. Just for, the, just for specificity, we're going to assume for most of this talk that N is greater than M. Everything I'm going to say works either way, but just to fix uh, our eye on something. So X looks something like this. N samples, M columns. <clears throat> All right. Um, I like pictures. Let's visualize X. The easiest way to visualize it is if we choose M equal to 2. Now, don't get confused. Uh, I know you're super used to seeing this picture in the context of regression, but pay attention. Here, the axes are x1 and x2, namely the columns of the data matrix. We're in an unsupervised setting. There are no labels or like a response variable y that we're observing in this case. So these dots here are my n samples, the rows in two dimensions. Okay. Now, what is the rank of the data matrix? How do you think about rank? I mean, it's really early in the morning. Let's not go to like the minimum number of like linearly independent. Da, 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 da. Like, well, what's like a more intuitive way of going, going for the rank? Geometrically, maybe. It's kind of like what, what like, does the data lie on like a one-dimensional thing or on like a two-dimensional thing or like a higher dimensional thing? So, so what would you say? What is the rank of, of this uh, data that, that I've drawn here? It's not flat. I mean, okay, like if we squint and in a moment we'll do exactly that. It is kind of flat, but it's not exactly flat. So <clears throat> the rank is two in this case, and in general the rank is at most m, the number of columns, since we've chosen that to be smaller than n. Okay, all right, so back to squinting now. Why might we want to take this data and in some sense reduce it to something with a lower rank, something that is indeed flat? Any, any suggestions? Denoising maybe, right? Uh, so the idea would be that if we believe that the generative process of the data is actually a line, if you're willing to, to make that assumption, and then assume that, yeah, you know, if I like squint my eyes, all the points are more or less on the line, and the reason why they're not on the line is just some technical measurement like thing, it's not the actual signal that generates the data, then it makes a lot of sense to, to think of the data as lying on this one line. So here on the Y, 
for general stability. So we can generalize better in our predictions. Another sort of practical reason, of course, this is like a silly example from two dimensions to one, but if you're a biologist, uh, maybe you're going to be reducing from 20,000 dimensional space into something like 10 dimensional space. So you're going to use less memory and your computation is gonna be faster. And speed. And even if you're not a biologist, you're all humans, so you, you'd like to make sense of your data. And it's much easier to interpret what the data is telling us if we have a more parsimonious representation of it. Okay. So just to be clear, we're looking here for a matrix X hat such that its rank is less or equal to some number k, which is less and in many cases a lot smaller than m that we started off with. Okay. But the dimensions are still n by m. What does that mean? So we went from something that lives in this plane to something that lives on a line, but still in our original coordinate system, if I take like some original data point here, let's call it xi, and I find where it goes in this low rank representation and call it xi hat, xi hat still had two coordinates in the original system. It's just that all of the points are now gonna be collapsed down to their closest location on the line. Now, does anybody have any objections as to why I decided to find the the closest in the low rank with an orthogonal like line. Do you have any suggestions? Do you have an, another favorite distance? Maybe Euclid like, you know, stole your milk sometime or something? Does everybody like to measure distances the Euclidean way here this morning? Yeah? Uh, all right, well, you know, uh, we're all sleepy and maybe we can't like really remember what other ways there are and that's great for me because I'm only gonna stick to this one. Uh, but just to give you yet another motivation as to why this is a pretty natural choice is uh, through a probabilistic sort of setup of what's going on here. If we say that our observations, xi, are drawn from a multivariate normal with some unknown mean but a low rank mean, the xi hat, and some variance. So remember this is unknown. If I want to fit this parameter, what would I do? I would do maximum log likelihood. And you remember what Gaussians look like, right? It's like e to the minus and basically Euclidean distance squared. Okay, great. So that means that the maximum li log likelihood in this case is exactly the same as saying I am actually minimizing the distance between each point and its low rank approximation squared, and I'm summing over all of my data points. Great. Uh, how might I want to think about this? I think I might want to think about this as a reconstruction error. So I start with the data that is potentially n-dimensional, but I don't, or rank m, but I don't think that it really comes from that. It's really noise that's inflating the rank of the matrix. And instead I want to approximate it with something that has sort of more structure and lower rank. Um, and it, it, in my uh, quest for approximating it, I'm going to make some error. I'm gonna be away in some sense. But uh, this is the quantity that's gonna be my favorite quantity of measuring the reconstruction. What are other ways to write this? Oh well, I can remember what uh, you know, L2 Euclidean distance squared actually is. So this is equivalent to saying minimize and then put two summations, right? Still the first one and then j from one to m, and now element-wise of this matrix and its low rank approximation. Or I can 
can compactify it in matrix notation. And I can say this is the same thing as finding the minimum of x minus x hat squared. What is this strange norm? Oh, this is just take each matrix, unrow it into one long vector, and then remember how you take distance to the vectors. Okay, uh, and so I'm looking here over the space of all possible matrices x hat such that their rank is bounded by some k. So this answers the question how. Now I already gave a spoiler alert to the question what or who is, is the solution to this problem. So what I'm saying here is that if I wanted to find the matrix that is the minimizer of this reconstruction error, and if I were to call it x star, then there is a theorem that tells me exactly how to get x star every single time. So the theorem, it has a, it's one of these fancy theorems that are just linear algebra but has three people uh, on the title. So uh, Eckert, Young, Mirsky, And I'm first gonna write it in a very hand-wavy way because we haven't uh, you know, brushed up on what SVD really is. So I'm just going to say X star is the truncated singular value decomposition of the original data matrix X. So let's remember what SVD was all about. So I have the data matrix X N by M and I can write it as the product of three things. The dimensions uh, are somewhat important here. So U is a matrix N by M. The columns of U are orthonormal vectors. What does it mean? It means their length is one, they're orthogonal to each other, so they form an orthonormal basis in RM. They're also called the left singular vectors of X. Sigma is the easiest one, so I'm just actually gonna start with that. It's just a diagonal matrix. It has the singular values on the diagonal, denoted like so, and also let's assume that they're ordered from the largest to the smallest, and they're you know, going to be definitely all non-negative. This is M by M. V, M by M, no, here it's like, it's transposed, um, but, um, uh, the, the columns of V are also on an orthonormal basis in RM, and they're called the right singular vectors, but they have another name as well. Do you remember their name? Somebody? Like, there is a hint there. It's like SVD something else. Something principal. Back to John's joke. <laughs> All right, cool. So it, it turns out that uh, if the data X has columns that are mean centered, uh, then V contains the principal directions and U times sigma are the principal components. These are just some familiar words, but can we visualize this? And the answer is yes, we can. Uh, v, we said, is an orthonormal basis in Rm. Back to our picture is an orthonormal basis in R2. The first direction here is a unit vector, V1, and the second is something orthogonal to it, also unit length, V2. How did I know to draw them this way? Well, back to our understanding of PCA and uh, the reason why people like it and use it so much is that it captures the directions of variability in the data. So the first principal direction is the direction in which if I were to project the data onto this vector, I'll get the most spread, okay? So here, looking at our you know, roughly 45 degree cloud of points, uh, this is going to be the direction onto which 
rejecting the point, points is going to have them uh, have retained the most variance. And then uh, SVD or PCA is such a method that it necessarily produces orthogonal components. So we're forced to have the other one go this way. Any questions so far? No? Okay. Uh, the question is what happens if the data is not centered? Uh, just uh, to my opinion, just annoying like extra bias and, and like you'd center it, uh, but we can take this to the discussion. Does anybody else have another answer to this? Or? Good, okay. So here we, we've just introduced SVD. Now, now let's see what is SVD useful for? It's just like then, then that picture is off away from zero. And so the, I don't know, anyway. Right, so with PCA, and we can definitely go into more depth in the discussion, but what you look at is X transpose X, and knowing what the SVD of X is, assuming that these are centered, this ends up uh, being equal to uh, V sigma squared V transpose. But the interesting thing is the interpretation of this as the covariance matrix or to be exact, if the data is centered, this gives you a non-biased estimator of the covariance of the data. Um, and if you haven't centered, you have to like do some like annoying thing of like that kind of nature here. So it's analogous to asking, what if I computed the variance without subtracting the mean? Yeah. I mean, you can, it doesn't, it's not the variance. Yeah. It's like a second actually, moment it's delay X, thing. X transpose, not X. Uh, no, no, it's X transpose X. It is an M by M. So <coughs> it's telling us how the features are correlated with each other. Okay. I yeah. think, okay. Yeah. Yeah, how you orient what you're trying Well, it depends on what you're calling your features, what yeah. you're calling your samples. Yeah, we can't even agree on that in that field. I don't know where we're going, but, but yeah. All right, cool. So what, what do I notice here from like my SVD slash PCA kind of look at things? I notice that I have a factorization so I've written this as a product of two things. I also notice that, um, how do I get the principal components? Well, I multiply on the right hand side by V and I get Q sigma V transpose V because we have orthogonal columns here. This is an identity. So if I wanted to use SVD as a dimensionality reduction technique, related but a different thing from low rank approximation, I can exactly get it through an equality here by projecting the data X onto this orthonormal basis V. Let's check the dimensions quickly. N by M, M by M, N by M, M by M. Oh wait, I lied. I didn't reduce the dimension. How would I reduce the dimension? I still have X by N by M. Didn't reduce anything. Yeah, just drop the like later ones. So let's uh, introduce a little more notation. Let's imagine that V, I've collected here into V1, the first K columns of that. V2 is the rest. So now I'm going to play the same projection game, but I'm not going to use the whole basis. I'm going to use just the first K dimensions. So what I get is X times V1, is equal to, well, X from its SVD, U sigma V transpose V1. All right, now we're all warmed up. It's like, you know, 15 minutes since we started. We can uh, do math in our head. Let's see. V transpose is this thing, but transposed. I'm multiplying it by just this piece. And remember the special property of this matrix. Things are orthogonal, so orthonormal. So when I multiply them, I either get one or zero. When I multiply things from here, by this I get an identity. When I multiply the rest of them by this, they're orthogonal, I get zero. So this thing here, I want you to think of it as uh, a bunch of ones of dimension K and then a bunch of zero. So it's a diagonal matrix with ones and then a bunch of zeros. Now next to here, sigma. Remember, sigma is this beautiful, simple thing, just diagonal entries, everything else is zero. 
And let's even write it like that. Sigma one is gonna collect the first K singular <laughs> values. The rest are gonna be here, padded by zeros on the side. When I multiply this by this type of thing, what do I get? Oh well, this side times an identity is the same thing and everything else gets killed, all right? So here this is sigma one, a lot of zeros. On to u, let's also write u in that form. And by k, the rest. I multiply this by this, what survives? Just this. Okay, awesome. So what we said is that if I take the data matrix, I write multiplied by just the first k principal directions, I'm going to get u1, sigma1, v1 transposed. N by k, k by m. Now I've truly reduced the dimension. And by the way, this is why, can everybody see? Maybe I should, okay. This is why um, truncated SVD is, is uh, called a linear dimensionality reduction technique because I can multiply the data matrix by another matrix, project it in a linear way and exactly get the lower dimensional representation that I'm looking for. What do you want to transpose from there? Oh. So that's the x hat, right? That you can, but now that's Thank you. Hat. Yes, that, that's, I'll come here, right. Uh, to get to, to the actual TSVD, which is not the low dimensional representation, but the low rank N by M representation, I take what I had there and I multiply by, by V1 transpose on both sides. Now this is the TSVD, and this is what I had to do to the data to get there. So this is my X star from the theorem. Okay, uh, any questions? Good, um, great. So we brushed up on what SVD and PCA are all about. Let's discuss pros and cons. The theorem here, Eckerd Young, tells us that X star computed in this way is the minimizer to our reconstruction loss over matrices with rank K at most. So one pro of SVD is that it is optimal. Another thing that we like about it is that there are fast implementations. It's computable. The solution that we would get is essentially unique. There's something bad about it. In certain cases, it lacks interpretability and robustness. Now interpretability and robustness, really they are two faces of the same coin. Yes? I was exactly about to do that. Like, you know, philosophically speaking, they're two sides of the same coin. If I, if I think of like some low rank approximation or some dimensionality reduction technique, and like let's say I take N samples uh, from my data, I do one replicate and I compute my low rank approximation. And then I collect in the same, as, as best as I can, 
process another set of N samples and I compute it again and again and again across different batches, if the uh, low rank approximation that they get varies like dramatically from replicate to replicate, th then it's not robust. In, in the same sense, it is not interpretable. If I'm trying to capture something meaningful and underlying about the phenomena and each time I run it on replicates, I get a different thing, then this cannot be interpretable. I don't know what they mean from time to time. Uh, does that make sense? So like, um, what do I mean in, in particular? I mean that we did this and then let's say we did it again, um, but there was some like batch effect and uh, maybe the, the variance from the batch is not the most strong signal, but it is strong enough to start influencing, you know, maybe not the first principal direction, but like the second or the third. And from there on, everything is messed up because we're forced to be orthogonal from there on. So we lose the robustness. And now I'll argue that there are situations in which we also lose interpretability. Let's think of a very, very simple experiment. We're collecting RNA-seq data from two cell populations and we know two sort of markers for them. Uh, they're gene one and gene two. What I expect to see from the collected RNA, something like, you know, a bunch of cells here, they're like, have a bunch of G1, maybe a little, some of them have a little bit of expression in G2. And the other population is here, a bunch of high G2 expression and maybe some of them a little bit of low G1 expression. Now let's ask ourselves, what would PCA do? What would PCA do? Well, PCA would center the data and then it would find the direction of maximum variance. So it's gonna be something along this direction. So we're going to have our first principal direction, V1 going, let's say, here, and the second one is forced to be orthogonal to it going here. Any questions about that? Well, you might think this is cool and good and interpretable, but let's examine is it. So sure, like along this, uh, this axis here, this principal axis, in, in this positive direction, I'm getting my cell type two. In this negative direction, I'm getting my cell type one. But what does it mean? So if I brought this back here to the beginning, uh, what this principal direction is telling me is that things here, they're positive in G2, but negative in G1. I don't know how to make sense of negative gene expression. And furthermore, the second strongest uh, direction in the data is both positive in G1 and G2, which doesn't correspond to our intuition of having in this case close to orthogonal cell types. Okay, what would we want to get instead? What can we dream of? Maybe we can dream of a world in which we get some component that goes straight to cell type one and another component that gets straight to cell type two. Now, are they interpretable? I would argue, yes, they're very interpretable. This one here, it is very low in G2 and it is very high in G1. It is capturing the behavior of this cell type. And the same goes for the other one. Everybody agree? How would we accomplish such a miraculous thing, you say? Oh well. In the special situation in which the data is non-negative, we'll do this with non-negative matrix factorization, like this. So we'll say this. Original data is approximately the product of two things. This is our basis. And these are the loadings of each sample in that basis. And we're going to require that both the loadings and the basis are non-negative. It's just like a lazy notation to say every entry of these matrices is greater or equal to zero. Now, how have I achieved low rank approximation? I haven't unless I tell you something specific. So here, this is n by m, this is n by k, and this is k by m. And since I have this uh, like bottleneck here of this dimension, I ensure that the rank of this product cannot exceed k. Okay. 
Um, I've written something a little bit hand wavy, even though it gives us great intuition of what's going on, but how do we actually solve for H and W that have these properties? Well, we already agreed that Euclidean distance squared is a natural way to go. So let me try to find optimal X star and W star as the solutions to fitting the data the best that they can in our square distance sense. Do you have a question? Yeah. Okay, no problem. Okay. Um, let's discuss pros and cons. It is interpretable there are past implementations and we'll quickly discuss how you might uh, solve this problem <coughs> the somewhat sad news is that the solution is not unique So the solution to this optimization problem is not unique, and in a moment I'll explain why that is the case. And uh, Dylan is going to help us reason in the talk at uh, 10 o'clock how to overcome that non-uniqueness problem. Okay, so time for pictures. Okay, some of you who got here early may have uh, seen the image that I'm about to show, so you might have an advantage, so I expect you to speak up. <laughs> the question is, look at this objective function, right? What do you think this looks like? Is it a nice problem? What do I mean by a nice problem? When I'm doing optimization, what is nice? Convex. Nice is convex. All right, let's not focus too much on the domain. Let's, let's focus on like the shape of the loss function. Convex, roughly speaking, means it's like one big ball, and uh, you're a little ball when you go optimizing. You start somewhere, you're always gonna kind of like circle, circle down, or go straight down. You're going to go down, always down, down, down to your favorite place, the global minimum in a convex problem. Now, is this a convex problem? It's kind of tempting to say yes. It's, all, it's like, it's squared, yeah. It's squared, but there are two things, like uh, H and W. So, so let's first answer a simpler question. If I thought of X, not uh, of H, not as a variable, but as a constant. If I had X, you know, constant, my observations, minus H, another constant, times W, the only parameter. And I take the difference squared. Is that convex? Yes. Oh, awesome. Other way around, W is a constant, H is the only unknown. Is it convex? Okay, well, so it's gonna blow your mind what you're gonna see in a moment, that somehow when you consider the product is no longer convex, it's not jointly convex. It has some like kind of weirdish behavior. Like what, what I mean by this is, well, while the projector is warming up, I can sort of prime you on that. It's really hard to visualize this stuff. In fact, it would be a lie if I told you I know what this looks like in, in anything beyond like the simplest, uh, simplest, simplest example of very, very small dimension. So. Let's say X is a scalar and like its value is one. And uh, H and W, scalars two. So one minus H times W squared. This is the objective function. What does it look like? How would I draw what it looks like? Well, you know, I'll like take my H dimension and like my W dimension and here in like some third dimension, I would like to draw what one minus uh, H times W squared looks like, okay? And uh, particularly, I'll be focused on this part here where both are positive or non-negative, okay? And I'm super interested 
and characterizing the critical points. Uh, is there a chance we can get the screen? Now, before we get ahead of, of ourselves and look into three dimensions, let's look at the level sets of this loss function. So kind of like get a two-dimensional representation of like how high and how low this loss is over this support. This is what we have shown here. The red line and this red dot are the collection of critical points of that function. So if you were to take a derivative set it with respect to H, take another derivative with respect to W, so those equal to zero and so you, you'd find H equal to W equal to zero to be one solution and the rest of the solutions are of the form H times W equals one. This is exactly this red, um, you know, infinitely many local minima and one saddle point there at zero, zero. Now, if you're struggling with this two-dimensional representation and you still don't believe me that this is not a convex function, let's look at it in 3D. Really, it's not convex. So here we have a saddle, and here we have a valley full of local minima. Now, like, really, 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 it's not convex. Okay. So how, how does one solve a non-convex problem? Sorry, can you speak up? Well, I mean, you, you, you never can, but I mean, Newton's method is maybe the best you can, I mean, it's always a good Yeah, like you solve the same way you would solve a convex problem and, and you just don't know exactly where you're gonna end up. So here is our objective. Oh, sorry, I've used like some extra fancy notation here. It's like called the Frobenius norm squared. It's just the same thing we said. You like make it one big long vector and take the L2 norm squared. What you do is you start randomly somewhere on that non-convex surface, and you start descending down with gradient descent. What does that look like in particular is you have your random guess, and then at each iteration, you, you're going to uh, also simplify your life a lot, a lot by making it a block coordinate, coordinate descent. So you're not jointly taking a step both in H and W, but it, it, at each turn you're fixing. H is fixed, I'm going to optimize for W. Now I end up at a new place for W. From there, fix it, optimize for H. Does that make sense? So this is just your usual type of uh, equation uh, of a gradient descent method the old position, and you take a step in the decreasing direction, down, down, because we're minimizing, of this size, down following the gradient, okay? And as we saw, because it is not a convex problem, we don't know where we're going to end. It's not going to head towards the same place each time. So with each different initialization, we might end up in a different place. So it might look something like this. Here, like the, the little, like kind of bigger dots are the beginnings of, of our, like these are the random initializations. And you can like see where they end. They end, they kind of, you know, sort of head towards the local, like uh, infinitely many local minima, but they don't, definitely don't end up at the same place. But this, I'm sorry, I'm so. Just a moment, there's a question oh, here. For uh, yes. Yeah, so if you like truly, truly zoom in, <laughs> you'd see them zigzagging. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just, I, to, I totally am not trying to be a stickler, I'm just confused. Um, Please do. Uh, if, if uh, to me, this is like not a good example necessarily of non-convexity because I'm happy if they end up in that, anywhere in that basin, right? All of those are local minima, and there's only really one point that's not in there, right? Which, so I have to like sample that point Basically, if I'm anywhere, like, because that's a, just if I look at that surface in this domain, then, like, it's pretty easy to end up I certainly agree with you that uh, this is a super, super simple overall oversimplification of what's going on. But, like, all Remember, of these we have to choose that uh, x is a scalar and h is a scalar and w is a scalar. As you increase, actually, the dimensions of h and w into something more meaningful, yeah. uh, things start looking crazier. You have various kinds of saddles, various kinds of local minima. You don't have a single global minimum. 
And uh, you might start as a saddle and like move basically super sluggish around it and maybe never escape it. So even though with this example, I agree in a lower dimension, it's practically never going to happen that you're going to end up at the saddle. And uh, Dylan is going to motivate why Sam is not so scared about the fact that we're going towards infinitely many, but of the same kind of nature, local minima. Uh, I would argue that in higher dimensions, uh, th this problem is sort of mul multiplied. And it is uh, quite n not clear what's going on. I see, so you're, you're, uh, you're also, uh, so for you, you want, okay, sorry, just to like make sure I totally understand. So there are two things to me that are issue. One is that you have this infinitely many solutions, which is just because it's not strictly convex. Like you can get that from anything that's not, where you just have not strict convexity, right? Yes. And so that, that are the issue is that you don't have a unique solution. Like it could be that all things go to some, some minimum, they're all equally good, but they're not unique, so it's a little weird to figure out how, to, how you're going to deal with that in a kind of applied setting. All right, so, so what but then there's the separate issue, which is that you might have local minima that are not good at all. You know, saddle points or other things that are not good at all, where you can't get out of, that are harder to like just search around. Absolutely. Those are kind of yes, separate there, there are critical points of different natures here. In the simple case, we see one saddle point at zero, zero, and a bunch of local minima. In higher dimensions, the sort of complexity of types of saddle points and local minima uh, increases. And you might com converge toward, you might be attracted with your gradient descent towards either one of those, depending on where you're starting. Uh, the other thing that Sam mentioned here might be worth explaining. So the type of uh, non-identifiability that she's not so scared about is the type of uh, going towards the same local mean along this line. So that means that if I multiplied here by a diagonal matrix that had non-negative uh, values on the diagonal, in other words, if I scale the columns, as long as I, in the same sort of way, scale the rows of W, I'm going to have the same value of the function. And this is why we're seeing this uh, h times y equals one line of infinitely many local minima that are equally good in terms of the value of the objective function. So there's a third issue that comes up. The things you listed are all true for SCD as well, if right. you were to try yeah. to fit it this way. Here we've introduced a hard boundary that we're in the first court then. Wait, except for SVD does, I mean, it does have. Uh, SVD is not convex if you it, view it as a function of both H and W. Oh, separately. If you're trying to optimize it that way. But it does have a global minimum, I'm just saying. Like, there is, in the, in the actual landscape, there is one minimum. Like, yes. It has well, a nice the issue here is we are restricting the domain yeah. to the first court then. And so now you introduce hard boundaries, and the right. sense in which you get other minima that are local minima, but not local minima, is that they can exist Got on it. the faces Got of okay. the boundary. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Great, thanks, John. And thanks, Sam. Uh, all right. Uh, right, so back to why we like it. It is interpretable. Well, this was, this was the spiel about the uh, So NMF is interpretable. There are fast implementations. We kind of sketched out how you might go about uh, implementing an algorithm. Uh, the solutions are non-unique. Dylan is going to be able to deal with this, all right? Now, in the remainder of the talk, uh, let's go on a journey, a brief history of NMF journey. So it's really hard to, to like know for sure when an idea appeared for the first time. Uh, but in this case, it's easy to know when the idea was made so, like when it was made so apparent that the idea is useful, um, that, that really we can think of this as the birth of NMF. So in 1999, uh, Lee and Song published, I kid you not, two-page paper in nature, two-page two paper in nature, uh, which is, just uh, excellent at giving us the intuition as to why NMF works. And uh, the intuition is in the title. NMF is learning the parts of objects. So here, uh, we have considered the task of decomposing non-negative data of images. Here is an original image, and this is what NMF would learn. This is what PCA would learn. White to black are zero towards positive values. Red is going in the negative direction. Because we are forced to find coefficients that are non-negative, we're uh, multiplied by factors that are non-negative. Those factors have to be the parts of the whole thing so that I can say I'm going to take 
0.3 of this type of nose and 0.7 of that type of ear and, and so on and so forth. Um, so we get, it might be a little bit hard, but I would definitely encourage you to go read that two-page paper. Uh, but, but that's exactly what you're getting here, little noses, little ears, little eyes. PCA, on the other hand, learns these kind of strange eigenfaces that are really not interpretable. Okay. Then biology got on that this was a cool thing to do. Um, and the uh, Lander Lab, um, in collaboration with, with the Messerov Lab, uh, analyzed some cancer-related microarray data. Um, and, and they, they used non-negative matrix factorization. They were able to find patterns of gene expression that were interpretable. So here, uh, the samples are microarray experiments across genes and uh, metagenes that they found were completely interpretable in terms of biology. Now, in the interest of time, our history train is going to travel very, very fast towards the present, so much towards the present that it's actually going to overshoot a little. It's going to go a little bit into the future. This is unpublished work. This is going to appear sometime soon, but for now it's in preparation. It's uh, from my lab, and uh, it's an exciting thing. So it's a new technology called SlideSeq. Um, SlideSeq is a scalable technology for measuring genome-wide expression at high spatial resolutions. But what does that mean? It means that you can go, pick your favorite tissue, get a slice, and lay it over this surface of uh, tightly packed barcoded beads and transfer the RNA onto them. The beads are very small. The beads are 10 microns in diameter. Is that small enough? Well, it's smaller than some cells. It's larger than others. And there is no guarantee that we're centering the beads over the locations of the cells. But nevertheless, we're getting this high resolution information in an unbiased way across all genes from a tissue. How does NMF come into play? Well, it's non-negative data. So we can just take the expression of all beads, do NMF, and it turns out that it is indeed interpretable. We can find cell types, but can we do better? Yes, we can. We can remember that uh, you know, Evan Makosko from my lab, uh, along with R.P. Sanders and others, published a cell characterizing the adult mouse brain, a, 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 a paper about uh, an atlas characterizing the cell types in nine brain regions. Uh, based on drop seek data, so single cell data. Now, is drop seek the same as site seek? No, and, and this, this is really the, the fact that we were able to use NMF, derive a basis about cell types from one modality of data, drop seek, and then use this same basis for another modality of data, site seek, uh, shows us the robustness of NMF that we were talking about earlier. So what do I want to do here? I know that I have, let's say, 11 cell types from the single cell data, and I want to color them over on this size of tissue. Turns out I can do that. All of these yellow ones are the granule cells, the like 90% of the cells in the cerebellum. These green ones are cluster two. Where are you cluster two? Tiny fraction of them, the Purkinje interneurons. Here in the interior are the oligodendrocytes. And um, if I were to leave you with one final thought, is that NMF can do even better. NMF is a type of, well, it's really the foundation of all topic models. And last week we talked about LDA. Unfortunately, I'm not going to have time to explain what, how and why, but it is a probabilistic model over non negative matrix factorization, like many others. And you might recall that LDA, like all topic models, are great at doing soft clustering. These images here, they're hard clustering. I've taken one bead, and I've given it just one single cell type identity. But I can do better. I can actually decompose the signal for each bead. Because they're not centered over individual cells, it is likely they're going to get some contributions from different neighboring cells. And those neighboring cells may not be of the same cell type. So I can actually take the basis derived from the single cell data, project the beads, the expression of the beads onto that basis, and get contributions. So this bead here 
it got uh, something like 0.8 granular, and then nothing from Purkinje interneurons and so on, and little contributions from other cell types. Any questions? Just really quick, um, last week when I talked, um, a guy from my lab was then like, did you actually, he asked me if I actually had tested to make sure that you know, I couldn't have just used PC, some, some interpretation of PCA, and I didn't actually check that. Like, I should go back and look and see how closely the, PC, the PCs line up with the topics or the factors and the, you know, if, if it's possible. I mean, obviously, you have negative loadings. It's, it's a little bit difficult to figure out if there's a good mapping, but I just wonder if you checked, if you guys checked that. I mean, I know, I'm not, not I don't mean linear algebra-wise, right? No linear algebra-wise, picture-wise. There are two populations, and I, yeah, no, I said I'm talking about data, and then I wrote a bunch of formulas. Okay, so, like, here, picture-wise, PCA is not going to be interpretable. We showed, that, we showed that in the example, but it's always going to find, like, one fewer, like, ways of expressing the data than the number of clusters. Like, if I have two clusters, mm -hmm. there's going to be one PC that distinguishes mm -hmm. them. Okay, so, so does that answer? I'll show it as well in some generic sing, uh, simulated data. Yeah, I just yeah. think it's not, it's not totally clear because of that example. That doesn't translate necessarily to, you know, like a clear example where, I mean, actually, anyway, we can talk, we can talk about it. Let's take, let's, let's yeah, talk, let's, let's take, talk about this because we also talked more about this example of when you have Yeah, the orthogonality also may be a, a poor choice there and so right. on. Right, and, so and also there's like something where you have repressive genes that we can talk about after. Yes, thank you. Okay, yeah, let, let's take uh, the rest of the questions in the discussion at 11. Thanks. Yeah, uh, John, thank you so much for that uh, intro. And I just also want to point out that the work I'm going to talk about is joint with Adrian Perez, uh, who's sitting over there, so you can wave to everybody. Uh, He's one of my classmates, and an awesome guy. Uh, so uh, I'm really excited to tell you guys about this work. Uh, sort of the crux of it is it's uh, very similar to what Sam was talking about so last week. Oh, microphone. Can you, guys, can you all hear me? Does that do anything? Uh, great. Um, so it is sort of similar to, to what uh, Sam was talking about last week. Uh, it's really trying to get at more complex aspects of single cell RNA-seq data, and specifically cells that have more than one main signal going on in their, their expression program. And that and soft clustering will be a natural solution to that. Uh, and so to motivate it, I want to talk about what are the kinds of signals you might be looking for in your uh, gene expression data. And the most uh, common thing that people look for, and I would say 90% of the, the single cell papers that, that I've read so far have gone after this, is uh, cell type. Uh, oh, this marker doesn't work. So cells, uh, you know, progressed on different lineages to arrive at uh, cells that have very different gene expression programs on the whole, and uh, that is a really important uh, signal. And uh, we also so. Uh, in addition to cell type, we have all the differentiation that gives rise to those cells. And that might be present in your data as well. But this is really just one kind of signal, and, uh, and there are other kinds as well. So uh, notably, cells are responding to signals in their environment. Some really primary examples of this are that you have immune cells uh, that are out there patrolling for different pathogens, and when they find one, they get stimulated and uh, turn on hundreds of genes in response to that. Uh, that's one kind of program. In addition, you might have responses to, to nutrients in the environment, like hypoxia induces a very strong gene expression program. Uh, and so these are uh, uh, signals that might be of primary interest uh, in your data. Uh, in addition to this, uh, cells go through normal phases in their lives, just like we do. Uh, so we can talk, think about life phases as another source of variation. Uh, and uh, notably, uh, cell cycle uh, is a really important uh, signature in gene expression data because uh, it induces hundreds of genes. But there are others as well. And we can think about apoptosis being one and others still. 
And then there's going to be a, a handful of, of other kind of more miscellaneous signals that you might find, like maybe uh, mutations might induce changes in gene expression in the context of cancer. I'm not really going to go into these, but you can think that there, there are others. Changes that are co that are involved that two cells go through together, for example, or two cell types go through together, right? Like a co, they may have distinct cell types, but they also communicate with each other, and that induces some kind of yeah. Change. So I would kind of put that under like environment, environment. because you're you're encountering other cells that are giving you co-stimulatory signals. Uh, so I put that under environment. And the way I'm going to talk about this, uh, the terminology I'm going to use for this whole talk is I'm going to talk about gene expression programs. or GEPs for short. And I'll probably lapse into calling them JEPs at some point too. Uh, and so I really want to make this concrete because I'm going to talk about it a lot uh, in this talk. Uh, and it gets bandied around a lot in systems biology. Uh, in gene expression programs, we, we tend to think about uh, genes that co-vary in a data set in a quantitative way. Uh, you can even say in a stoichiometric way if you think that the ratios of the, the gene expression levels are important. Uh, so we're talking about genes that co-vary. And the reason we think that they co-vary is because we think they're regulated by, in a coordinated way by a shared set of transcription factors. Uh, and so this is kind of an assumption that there's modularity in gene expression. Where genes that are involved in the same function uh, are often co-regulated. And this arrow here is sort of aspirational as well as kind of this arrow here. Uh, but you, you can find correlated genes that don't have any meaning. But this is really what we're looking for when we're talking about gene expression programs. Um, hey, quick question. Uh, this is very important. When you say gene expression, are you talking about uh, whole exons or portion of the exons? Uh, you could really look at it in either way, depending on which data set you have. I'm primarily going to be talking about uh, like counting barcodes at the three prime end of the gene. So for the most part, I'm talking about you know, not really considering uh, splicing, but you could as well. Um, and so for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to really break these up into two classes of gene expression programs that I'm going to talk about. These ones that correspond to cell type and differentiation, I'm going to talk about as identity programs. And these ones that correspond to a cell's response to the environment uh, or to its life cycle phases, I'm going to call these activity programs. And this kind of is an analogy of saying you can find out from the data both who a cell is uh, which cell type it is, but also what is it doing? Am I dividing? Am I responding to, to pathogens in the environment? Uh, wow, I'm realizing I put these over here when I meant to put them over there. Uh, okay, so uh, what actually happens when you have activities that are present in your single cell RNA-seq data? Uh, so to talk about this, I am going to just give a really simple example where let's say you have five cell types and one activity. And this is really uh, like an oversimplification, but just to kind of illustrate how this might look in a given single cell RNA seq data set. Uh, and so uh, the way we visualize single cell RNA seq data is often with a TSME plot where you have uh, cells that are close together in high dimensional space are close together in these two dimensions. And uh, one case that, that happens fairly frequently is the cell type is the strongest signal in the data. And so cells really cluster by cell type. But within these cell type clusters, you might also have cells that are expressing this activity program. They might be kind of scattered about in here. They might actually kind of cluster closer to each other uh, in their cell because they're more similar to each other. But in general, uh, it wouldn't be easy to, to, to know that such a, an activity program is going on in this data set. You would have to, you know, if you were to cluster it, you would kind of combine these cells together. And that might actually lead you to, to misunderstand what the cell type program is, because you're going to be averaging signal from the activity with uh, cell, uh, signal from the identity as well. Uh, another really common case might be that the activity program really dominates over the identity program. So you would have separate uh, signals from your cell types, but then you might have what looks like a sixth cluster in the data, which are all cells potentially from multiple cell types that are expressing a shared activity. And you might misidentify that as a cell type, and you wouldn't also wouldn't know what are the cell types that are con uh, contributing to this cluster. 
And this is really a problem if you do hard clustering. So I'm gonna talk about soft clustering where you allow the cells to have multiple contributors to their expression. But if you were to do hard clustering, you would you know, collapse these into individual groups and collapse this into an individual group. And you wouldn't really understand the full complexity of what's going on with the cells in there. Um, okay, so uh, how are we going to address this problem? Uh, in practice, uh, we've already heard a primer about this, but the solution is really gonna be a kind of matrix factorization or a soft clustering. So when we talk about matrix factorization, you start off with your gene expression matrix. And uh, this is gonna be cells by genes in its dimension. And we're looking to, to factorize this, or sorry, this is really approximate, not equals. Uh, we're, we're looking to approximate this as a product of two matrices. This. And we want uh, this to tell us about the data and we want it to be really interpretable. So I'm gonna call this matrix here the programs matrix. And it's gonna be K by, by G. And really each row here uh, we want to correspond to a different uh, program, PK, down here. Uh, and this matrix, I'm gonna refer to as the usage matrix, because it's gonna end, this is gonna be C by K, number of cells by, by the number of programs. And really this is supposed to tell us uh, which cells are using which programs. So if a cell was you know, made up entirely of its cell type program, it should have a high weight for that program, it should be zero for everything else. Uh, but this actually allows you to model cells with a mixed identity, potentially. So a cell that uh, is a you know, T cell that's also dividing would have a weight for both of those programs. Um, and we really want this to be in, in interpretable units. So ideally, these programs uh, should be in units of average gene expression of some kind. Uh, And uh, this matrix of usages uh, should be something that, that tells you about like how, what percentage of the gene expression for a given cell is derived from each of these programs. Uh, and so this is kind of the, the generalization of, of clustering in a way, because if you were to think about this uh, in the hard clustering case, that essentially boils down to the case where you've constrained this matrix to be binary. You know, maybe it's gonna be one here, but then zero everywhere else for a given cell, and one here, and then zero everywhere else for another cell. And this is gonna tell you which uh, cluster a cell belongs to. And in that case, the programs here are gonna tell you about the average uh, expression of a cluster. So uh, with our soft clustering, we now have, have relaxed this. It doesn't have to be a binary anymore. It can be a mixture. So that allows you to have cells that have an activity as well as an identity. Um, and so why is it worth it to, to do this? Why do we care about finding activity programs so much? They can really be of primary interest in your data, such as the immune activation and the hypoxia and, and other kinds of cases that could be important. Okay, uh, and so how do we do this? I mean, matrix factorization is incredibly common in single cell analysis as it is. Uh, most commonly, uh, it's PCA that's used, but there are other methods like ICA. We heard about uh, independent component analysis, principal component analysis. We heard about uh, latent Dirichlet allocation last week, and there's also NMF. And we actually heard from the, top, from the primer earlier today that if all you care about is minimizing the reconstruction error, uh, the truncated SVD is actually going to give you the minimal reconstruction error. So we figured it out from the point of view of, of finding a, a, an optimal solution from the point of view of minimal uh, reconstruction error. But I'm gonna argue that we care about something else besides just minimizing the error. We really care about the programs being interpretable. And to do that, we actually need to look at, at, uh, at data and to see which of these are giving us uh, programs that, that make the most sense. And on top of that, we care about robustness. So uh, Sam was talking about, uh, I mean, uh, Alex was talking about this earlier, but uh, NMF and also LDA and ICA are non-deterministic. And under-constrained. And as a result, uh, there's this problem of local optimum and, and also like non-identifiability. And so you can end up with different solutions every time you run uh, your factorization. And we need to do something to, to address that. 
So uh, that's uh, where this consensus factorization method that I've come up with uh, comes in. It can help you with increasing the robustness. And uh, we care about that because it can increase the interpretability of the result. So how does the method work? Um, you start off with uh, your gene expression matrix, and you run your, uh, your factorization method r times. Instead of just once. And what you do is you combine the, the program matrix you get from your factorization, you concatenate it. So you end up with a, a one bigger matrix, like this. That is now going to be RK by G instead of just K by G. And uh, if you are getting the same result every time, uh, you should really have uh, some components that, that are coming up in multiple clusters. So for example, you might have a blue program that is found in every replicate. But in practice, you're, you, uh, because of the, the stochasticity of these algorithms, you actually don't find the same component every time necessarily. So maybe the red component came up two out of four times and it's less common in the data. Uh, and so we need a, a way to kind of pull out these components that are the same across the replicates and group them together so we can average them to increase the accuracy and also some way to, to decide whether we're going to keep, you know, how we're going to deal with these solutions that only came up a fraction of the time. Yeah, so this question. When you factorize um, R times, I mean, how are you avoiding getting the same answer? It's different seeds. We different all start seeds, from I different uh, different random initializations. And how sensitive are your programs to the initialization? So I'm actually going to show lots of examples of that with real data. It turns out that in some cases it's more sensitive than others, but, uh, but you always get variable solutions that can benefit from this. Sam? Are you going to have a chance to talk about, um, like to me it's not totally obvious that the things that would drive consistent signal, at least overall in the data, would necessarily be the most interesting or important. Um, just because the overriding initial signals, at least, like might be, just they might just be the strongest, or the you know like they might like the like mine that are about how big the cell is, or how generally activated it is, or whatever. Those are super strong signals. They'll be really consistent, but they won't necessarily be the most interesting. Or yeah, and sometimes you know. the case that a signal that that seems to be real doesn't come up in every replicate. And that kind of depends on the strength of the, the signal, as you say. So this method doesn't necessarily constrain you to keep the most common. So are we having the right choice of K? Yeah, having the right choice right. of K is also that's important. All, yeah, that's also, if you, I mean, totally, you could end up changing that. I just wonder if it would be cool to also maybe down the road think about um, if you kind of have some that you think are stable, if you remove them, then can you evaluate better the others or something like that? I don't know if there's a way to kind of do it in an iterative way that doesn't require overall stability. Yeah, but that, like you that, that makes sense. I mean, I think if a thing is only coming up in a very small fraction of the runs, you really probably don't trust it. But on the other hand, if it's coming up you know, in 20% of the runs or 30% of the runs, you might. Uh, I mean, I guess it depends how much its signal is getting crossed with other signals. So if you, that's why I was thinking maybe yeah. if you do it iteratively, it could make sense to kind of remove things that you feel confident I'll, I'll about. I'll talk about that a bit with okay, a few examples. Cool. Why don't you choose only the one with the lowest I think this is what people do with non-start optimization. Yeah. What start? Can you repeat that? Uh, yeah. So like another approach that sometimes people do is they kind of throw away all the replicates, but they keep the one that had the minimum reconstruction error. And I actually tried that out, and it didn't work quite as well in the data. It's kind of like maybe overfitting in a way to to the the noise in the data. Uh, and and you kind of avoid that by by doing this averaging procedure. I'm going to talk about. What does it mean that it didn't work? Like, what was your way of telling that it didn't work? Uh, well, so I'm going to show simulated data where I have ground truth and show that it was actually not the, the minimum uh, correlation between the ground truth and, and the inferred programs. Okay, that's in the square matrix also depends on the, on the technology. So for this R runs, you also have like R many first matrices. And exactly. Like I'll, talk, I'll talk about how I get a, cons a final version of this at the end. Yeah. Uh, anything else? Yep. Um, so wouldn't the, the optimization objective also be sensitive to different scales of expression? Like for yeah. Example? In practice, you know, I actually uh, will normalize the gene expression matrix and, and filter out low variance genes before I run it. And then actually at the end, after I found uh, a usage matrix that I think is, is good, I can actually refit the programs to be in units of my choice that are no longer normalized. Uh, and uh, and can fit it to all the genes, not just the high variance genes. So that's a really helpful thing to be able to do. 
I'll kind of get to that. Um, OK, so I have all these replicates. I have some components that are coming up multiple times. And I want to kind of pull them out and group them together. So what I do. Wait, can I, can I just, one other thing that I wanted to add to the, what your comment to Matan thing is just that I think some, it came up last week too, that same thing. You can also hope that you have correlation between uh, lower scale genes, say, and higher scale genes, right? Like, yeah, but you, it, you, can, you can, I mean. Let's talk about it in the discussion section because sure. I think it's a kind of complicated issue. Sure. Um, so uh, what you do at the end is you, you have these RK components. Uh, you can cluster them uh, into K clusters. Cluster. Uh, and you can visualize it by looking at the pairwise distances between all these components. Uh, look at the pairwise component distances. <laughs> so this pairwise distance matrix I'm talking about is going to be RK by RK. And it should have some good structure in it, some blocks of components that are coming up multiple times when you run the, the analysis. Actually, so you would hope that you know, your, your red program which came up every time would be a really solid correlation block in there. And you, and you would be seeing essentially a similar program coming up multiple times. Uh, your blue block might be smaller, actually, because it only came up in a fraction of the runs. Uh, and then you would have, you know, you can have kind of complex structure in here, it turns out, because of the, the multiple optima. So it might look like this. But this is actually really helpful uh, for you as analyzing your data, because you can kind of see what is going on. Like you can see that uh, a given component is being broken up into two, it's being split sometimes, and, and, and you might want to decide which one you think is more biologically relevant. Um, but in practice, you have this clustering. You can now uh, collapse within each of the clusters, com you know, combine average across the replicates that came up multiple times, uh, and have some final estimates of what, what the programs are in the data. So you might end up with your two programs, program one and program two, dot, 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 and uh, have you know, some estimates of uh, in, uh, each column here, the gene. And now you have an estimate of the expression of each gene in each program. Uh, and you have confidence intervals because you can actually look at you know, how much variance there was within a given cluster. So maybe the second program had high expression of these genes and low expression of these genes. Uh, and as was mentioned before, this is now this is still in the normalized scale. Uh, so uh, it's, you know, it might not reflect interpretable units of gene expression. Uh, so what you can do now is you have some estimates for this program matrix. Uh, you can fix those. Uh, and now you can actually refit this matrix with the, the, the average consensus programs. And actually, once you've done that, was that a question? No. Uh, once you've done that, you can fix this matrix. Uh, and now you can actually change the input gene expression data uh, to units of your choice. Uh, and then you can refit the programs into your desired units. And so that's what we're going to do. At the end of the day, we, we want our programs to be in uh, transcripts per million or some very interpretable gene expression unit. Um, OK, so now I'm going to go to slides. So do you do any kind of normalization for the size of the program when you take the distances, just so I'm curious? Uh, yeah, actually, we do. I think we, we take a cosine distance in practice, because that uh, controls for, for the average contribution. Uh, oh, wow, we need to lower the and what, Cool. What's the cost of, of holding k down to a certain size? Yeah, so what'll happen if you pick a very low value of k uh, is you'll actually end up with merges of the programs. Uh, you, you'll, you'll start combining two programs that are really distinct so, into so one. What I'm, what I'm asking is if you expand k, are there programs that you have that are going to split out? Yeah, that's right. Uh, so, I, uh, so I've actually found that if you use a very large k, often it just you get a bunch of junk programs at the end that, that are easy to identify. But I'll show a little bit about how I pick k uh, in a subsequent slide. Uh, basically, I pick K by comparing the error on one axis and also the, the stability of the solution, like how similar are the results across those replicates, and picking something that trades off appropriately between them. But there's no perfect rule for picking K. Multiple K's. On, on the K selection. So if you pick a K that's too large, when you get a junk program that appears, that won't be correlated across replicates. So when you're actually trying to do, when you're actually doing the sort of clustering step, if you overpick K slightly and every run you get one 
fake program that's just noise from the data, if that noise is not correlated across your runs, and in practice it tends not to be, you can essentially filter that out and, and sort of, there's not less of a penalty to over Yeah, good point. Uh, so this just kind of summarizes the, the main ideas that I showed before. So you start off with your gene expression matrix, you run your matrix factorization multiple times, and so you end up with multiple estimates of the programs. You combine them and you cluster across all the replicates. Uh, and then you take the, the median within each cluster and you, and you actually can look at kind of confidence intervals. And you can actually refit this into units of your choice. So okay, how do I evaluate this? Because I want to show that the programs you're learning match with some kind of ground truth gene expression program in the data. So uh, in general, we don't have ground truth. So I'll, I'll show you how it works on various real data sets, but I'm also gonna show how it works on simulated data where we can uh, look at ground truth. So this is a TSME of some simulated data. And I've simulated the data to have 13 cell type programs in it, uh, which are shown as different colors, but also one of these activity programs that is active in a subset of cells of multiple programs, of multiple cell types. And so cells that have a black circle around them are also expressing this activity program. And it turns out that, so I simulated it to be present in four cell types, the green, blue, red, and orange cell types. Uh, and the, the fraction of gene expression that's contributed by this activity program varies between 10% and 70% in the simulation. Uh, the other thing I should mention about the simulation is that I simulated doublets. Doublets are an artifact in single cell data where you have two different cells that are mistakenly collapsed into one. Uh, and so you might have a T cell and a B cell that are combined, for example, and, and you would just see an average program of both of them. So one advantage of matrix factorization is hopefully it will correctly model doublets as the combination of the two cell types that, they, that combine to form them. And so I'll, I'll show that in a bit. Um, so what would happen, uh, so, uh, sorry. I don't know if I can move this pointer out of the way. So uh, these are those cluster grams that I was talking about before, uh, where you look at the, the pairwise correlation of all the components if you run three different uh, algorithms, LDA, NMF, or ICA on them. And uh, what you can see is that uh, LDA kind of had the most noise in it. Like it, it would end up inferring kind of random components uh, depending on, on which replicate it was. NMF had a lot of stuff going on in it as well. So uh, if you look at this uh, block over here, that corresponds to a program that was robustly inferred in every single replicate. But if you look over here, you have a component that was identified in you know, maybe 80% of the replicates, but then in 20% if something else was found that was similar to it. Uh, and this is kind of what happens in reality with, with your real data. Yeah? So LDA is the solution that you're running MCMC, right? Uh, a variational inference. Uh, okay, so, but if you ran it. Uh, I'm just using the scikit learn for in, uh, implementation and it's converging. But principle, um, like, there is an answer, right? It shouldn't really be random. No, if so you there, there, are mul there are multiple, uh, if that's what we kind of talked about before, it's, it's really non-identifiable, and there's also multiple local, local optima. So it's kind of finding these weird local optima, it seems. But LDA isn't an optima, right? It's a Bayesian. <coughs> well, it's, it's minimizing a likelihood. Just hmm. looking at the map. Maximum so if we're doing math. Yes, that's, that's right, okay. exactly, that's right. I'm looking yeah. at the map, yeah. Uh, ICA uh, had kind of the most robustness. It's actually initialized to the SVD and then uh, op, you know, optimized from there. But even with ICA, there's some structure, and I'm not sure how well you can see it, but, uh, but I'll just tell you that that, uh, that benefited as well from, from this kind of method. Um, and so what happens if you run PCA? This goes to Sam's question from earlier. So uh, here, each row is a simulated ground truth gene expression program and each column is an inferred principal component. And what you find is that uh, you know, there's overall pretty good correlation between the components and the ground truth. Sometimes the components point in the wrong direction, but you know, that doesn't really matter. Uh, but in general, the, what you find is that the components are linear combinations of the true uh, uh, signals. Uh, so for example, this component is a bit of identity program one and a bit of identity program 10. Uh, and actually, uh, we were talking about this before in Alex's talk, it will systematically not identify one of the programs in the data, because it could only need 13 programs to explain 14 populations, essentially, and, and that's what uh, Sam, uh, Alex showed earlier. Um, what are the different solutions that are being found in individual NMF runs on the simulated data? So this is one NMF iteration, the same kind of uh, plot where the rows are ground truth and the columns are, are uh, inferred components, 
And in this case, there really wasn't a component that correlated well with the activity program. Uh, and as a result, you kind of have the activity program getting merged in with multiple, with the four identity programs with the cell types that express it. In another run, it found all, something correlating decently well to all the components, but there was a lot of noise. And, and as a result, you ended up with some components that have a bit of contribution from everything else. Uh, but here's the consensus version of NMF, uh, and it kind of looks very clean. Uh, and, uh, it, so in this case, empirically, it improved the accuracy. Um, so you can look at this for lots of different factorization methods. In this case, I have the consensus version of NMF, NMF alone, the consensus version of ICA, ICA alone, all the way down to PCA. And you can see that in general, uh, there's an improvement in the accuracy when you add on the consensus method. Did you try any kind of simulation where you had, um, like, the kind of data I showed last week where you had some sort of gradient in, in the expression of the program? I just wonder if how that changes this kind of result. So, so there is a gradient here from 10% to 70% for oh, a given cell. But I think your sorry. data. Sorry, does that mean 10% to 70 No, no. So some cells are, uh, have 10% of their gene expression contributed by the activity, and other cells have 70% of their gene expression contributed by the activity. It's not the same as your case, I think, which is where you have a lot of programs and they're not exactly sparse. Like some cells have like a you know, high usage of many of them, where this is a relatively sparse. Yeah, that's fine, but this, so you're saying you do have a pretty good gradient in there. There's, there's a gradient from 10 to 10. Okay. Like Sorry, that. I didn't understand. But I, I think she's also asking, is it within a cell type there's a gradient? Yes. Okay. Within a cell type, a given cell of a, cell, of a given cell type might have 10% of its expression from the program, or it might have 70% of its expression from the program. So the gradient is Right, but a gradient the, isn't, uh, sorry, I don't know how that ends up looking, and it doesn't, I don't want to slow you down, but like a gradient should look like you actually have cells with all of those. Like you have cells with a full range, not just a stochastic, some are high, some are low, or whatever, right? Like it looks like a gradient. It does, so I'll show that. Okay, great. Exactly. great. Uh, so there's this. Um, another way to look at it, I'm going to kind of gloss over this, is you can actually look at uh, if you predict which genes are in a given program, and you consider different thresholds on how strongly associated with the program you are consider how many of the, the genes that were simulated to be part of the program are found and how many are missed, and, uh, and CNMF performed best by this metric as well. Um, this kind of gets at what you were talking about. So here, uh, the uh, top row is the simulated usage, and the bottom is the inferred usage of, of a program. And uh, there's an example identity program here and an example activity program here. So in the simulated usage, it goes from something fairly low to something fairly high for, for, for cells. Uh, and this just shows that not only could the method infer the programs, but it could infer the loadings or, or how uh, much each cell was using each gene expression program. Uh, and this is kind of the doublet thing I was talking about before. Doublets are cells that have a high usage of two uh, distinct programs. Uh, One second. The, the slide below, you're, did that, you're saying that there are many cells that are inferred to have identity programs that they don't quite have. Is that correct? Uh, the lower left are, corner, that's what I understand. There's some, you know, it's not perfect. There's some non-sparsity in there. But, but in general, it picked it up, the identity program, quite well. You know, these, these are very low usages on the whole. I see. Um, I'm actually just going to skip this so I can get to, to the real data. Um, so I analyzed two real data sets here uh, and to, to kind of see that we could find activity programs in, in real data where, where, you know, things could be a lot noisier and more complicated than in those simulations. Uh, and so this data set, uh, is composed of brain organoids. So these are, they, they put uh, pluripotent stem cells in a dish and treat them with uh, neurotrophic uh, growth factors for nine months. And eventually you end up with, with these, uh, these organoids that have neurons essentially in them. Uh, and then they clustered the data and found there were retinal-like cells and there were astroglia and forebrain and uh, lots of different things going on in there. And uh, the reason I picked this data set initially was because I wanted to see if we could find cell cycle, which is like a very common activity program, and you know we'd better be able to find that. And actually, I was able to find some other unexpected activity program, which I'll give away is hypoxia, uh, that a lot of these cells are responding to, to the low oxygen environment in the organoids. So one thing to point is that the oxygen environment <clears throat> in a dish is actually uh, hyperoxic compared to most dishes. That's true, but it turns out there will be some cells that are in the middle of this organoid that are not having good access to oxygen and expressing VEGF and other things to try to, to, to stimulate you know, uh, uh, angiogenesis. So this is the plot I was just mentioning. I just want to show this briefly. Uh, uh, in blue, I'm showing the stability of the solution, and I measure stability with the silhouette distance, which I'm not going to explain just due to time. 
uh, and then in red is the error. And you can see that there's decreasing error and also stability decreases, and you can kind of pick a, a local optimum there, and that's kind of how I picked uh, K for this data set at 31. Uh, and also you can see these clustering, uh, cluster grams, not gonna talk about this filtering really. Uh, it, it actually, so I'll just mention it. It helped to filter out the, some of the components in the replicates that were the most outlier-ish, that had the lowest uh, similarity to their nearest neighbors. It improved the, the solution a bit if you were to, to do some of that filtering by, by truncating the tail of the distance to nearest neighbors. But this is what this looked like in real data. So there's, there's definitely some you know, inconsistency in the results, but on the whole you get a nice clustering. So uh, over here, the first plot is just showing the average uh, usage. Uh, so each row is a program and each column is a cell. Uh, and it's showing uh, the usage of each program in each cell. And I should just mention that uh, there are some cells, that, some programs that are very, very common and others that are rare. So just visually, I've squished them together to have the same amount of, of box for, for each program, for cells that have their maximum contribution from a, a, uh, each identity program. Uh, and I've gone through and interpreted the genes in the program to figure out what, the, what they correspond to, which are identity programs and which are activity programs. And I've kind of shown at the top here uh, what I'm gonna call identity programs, and the bottom here are activity programs. And I've also done this on, on the TSNE plot here for the data. So uh, the plot at the left, I've gone and colored each cell by its maximum identity program usage. Uh, and then you know, I've labeled that based on, uh, you know, some cells are astroglia, some are retina-like cells, some are forebrain, et cetera. Uh, and this, these plots on the right here are what I interpreted to be activity programs. And uh, so I found three activity programs, one that seems to correspond to hypoxia, and two that seem to correspond to cell cycle. Uh, and that was really uh, good to see that we found the program we expected would be here. And there's two cell cycle phases, G1S and G2M. Uh, so how did I actually know that those were cell cycle and hypoxia? Well, you can look at the genes in there. Uh, and so uh, this plot, I'm showing the, the, the contribution of various marker genes to the programs, uh, to what I'm calling the activity programs, and then to every other program down here. And some of the top associated genes for G1S were PCNA and uh, thymidine synthetase, which is really helpful for making uh, uh, second copy of the DNA. Whereas for G2M, you get lots of centrosome proteins, which are important for, for you know, uh, doing mitosis. And for hypoxia, the top associated gene was VEGF, which made a lot of sense for hypoxia, but all the other top associated genes were uh, you know, good markers of hypoxia as well. You could also see this by looking at gene ontology uh, enrichment, and you, know, you found cell cycle for uh, the, the G1S program and mitotic cell cycle for the G2M program. And the top associated gene set for uh, hypoxia was establishment of protein localization to the endoplasmic reticulum. And it turns out when there's hypoxic stress, the way the, the cell responds to that is by shutting off translation in the, the cytoplasm and really shunting uh, translation to the, uh, to the endoplasmic reticulum. So this actually made a lot of sense with what we were seeing. Um, and a really useful thing you can do when you have uh, identity and activity programs in your same data set uh, is you can look uh, for each cell type what percentage of the cells are active. So in this case, what percentage of the cells are dividing. Uh, and interestingly, there was a population that I called stem-like because they, they expressed really clear pluripotency factors and roughly 40% or al almost 30-something percent of those cells are dividing. Uh, and so that's really cool. And you can like, look at that across all the cell types in the data and it gives you dynamic information about the system on top of you know, a static picture of what are the cell types. Uh, okay. so. That was kind of the, the first data set was just, I expected there to be some programs and I wanted to see if I could find them. Uh, and I also found one that was sort of unexpected. Like the hypoxia, you know, I, I definitely wasn't expecting it going into it. Um, the next data set I looked at, uh, I, I found some programs that I think are truly novel or, or certainly uh, I didn't expect going in there. Uh, but also this was a data set that I could use to validate the method as well. Uh, because there were some expected programs in it. So I'll explain. Uh, this data set is from uh, 15,000 mouse visual cortex neurons following a visual stimulus. So they took mice and kept them in the dark for, for seven days, and then they shined light in their eye for either one hour or for four hours. And when you shine light in the eye, it, it causes the, the neurons to depolarize and sends a signal back to the visual cortex that says, we're seeing stuff, uh, you need to rewire and reconfigure how you're responding to visual input. Um, 
And so uh, after the stimulus, they, they micro-dissected out the, uh, the cells from the visual cortex uh, and uh, dissociated them and did single cell analysis. So in the data I'm gonna show you, there's a mixture of cells from zero hours of stimulus, one hour of stimulus, or four hours of stimulus. And uh, depending on which condition they came from, you might expect them to have uh, different gene expression programs that are induced. Uh, and so I wanted to see uh, in the supervised case, could I identify uh, a program that corresponded to the, the visual stimulus? Uh, and uh, uh, and you know, what would that look like? And what could it teach me? Uh, I'll also just say, uh, before I get there, uh, you might expect that in such a, an experimental system, uh, you better find it, you know, that's not that interesting. I'm also gonna look for it in a data set that was not experimentally manipulated at all, and I find it in there too, so that's really helpful. So this is the, the case selection for that data set. I'm just gonna kind of breeze through this. And this is the same kind of plot that uh, I was showing you before with what I'm gonna label as the identity programs as well as the activity programs. Are these identity programs pretty clearly I mean, are they, they're, they're, it's, you don't feel like you're hiding something by just discretizing and, and assigning one, each cell to one. Yeah, so it kind of, the, the heat map I showed before, it looks quite a bit like that. Oh, even, like that. even a bit better, it's very sparse uh, for the most part. Uh, but I'm not just showing it just a few the time here. Sure. Um, <laughs> and so the major uh, determinants of, of cell type in the visual cortex, it turns out, is which layer in the visual cortex the cells come in. So it turns out that there are six uh, visual cortex layers, uh, layer one through six here, and then uh, and there are uh, cell types that are very characteristic of each layer. And on top of that, there are excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons shown here at the top, uh, and uh, those have different, you know, they're different cell types as well. So we found all of the major cell types that, that were identified in the original paper by clustering. But in addition to finding those cell types in that way, we also found several activity programs, or five, that were spread out over the, 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 the cells in, uh, of multiple cell types. So you have you know, this uh, program uh, spread out over there, there, and there, and, and some of them are, are really diverse and, and are occurring in multiple cell types. And I'll just kind of spoil it. Uh, I labeled this program early response program, because that turns out that it's specifically induced in cells in the one hour condition. Uh, then there is a late response program superficial and late response program deep, which I'll get to in a middle in a minute. And then there is this other activity programs one and two, which did not uh, correlate at all with the stimulus. So how did I visualize this? Um, so each column here is a different cell type, uh, excitatory layer two cells, layer three cells, etc. Uh, and each row here is a different program. Uh, and so let's just go row by row. And each color here corresponds to cells from each condition. So in the first uh, row, you see that cells are over uh, express are, are inducing this program, are starting to use it at one hour, but not at zero hours, uh, across multiple excitatory cell types, but notably not in uh, populations of neurons that were not from the visual cortex or in inhibitory neurons. So this corresponds to a program that is specifically induced in one hour time frame from uh, a visual stimulus in, in those neurons. Uh, in addition, I found this other program that I'm calling the superficial late response that is induced at four hours in excitatory layer two, three, four, and five, one cells, but not in five, two, five, three, or layer six cells. And so I'm calling it the superficial late response because it is induced only in neurons in the superficial layers of the cortex. Whereas by contrast, this one that I'm calling the late response is induced most significantly in layer six neurons. And so this shows that there's actually a uh, uh, position dependence uh, in uh, how the activity program is manifesting in these different cell types, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, and then these other two programs are fairly flat across the condition. So these were not correlated with the stimulus. They were occurring in uh, all of the cell populations. So this just shows that I was able to find these uh, activity programs in these uh, stimulated neurons but I wanted to see if I could find them also in a population of neurons that were not treated in any way, uh, uh, where it might be harder to find them. And on top of that, it's a much smaller set of neurons. In this case, it's only uh, you know, less than 2,000. Uh, it's also a different technology altogether, where instead of doing in-drops, as in the previous case, they actually fax sorted out cells into individual wells and, and then did uh, sequ sequencing from there. Um, so uh, in here, I'm showing the overlap between the programs I identified in the first data set and the programs I identified in the second data set. 
And I'm just measuring the overlap as an odds ratio for, for how many genes are uh, associated with each program. I just drew a, a cut, you know, set a cutoff on considering a gene in a program or not for, for this comparison. And I actually found uh, programs that matched the, the, the identity programs of almost all of the cell types between these two programs, which was nice. But in addition, I found a program uh, in the, the validation data that actually had a very, very striking uh, correlation to the late response program that was found in the first data set. And you can also see that by correlation here. So uh, this is, uh, each dot is a gene, and it's showing the average expression in, in the z-score uh, of the, the expression in the primary data set and the verification data set. And there's a Pearson correlation of 0.645. So I'm gonna say that this is essentially the same late response program I found in the first data set, but these cells were just normal neurons dissected out from the visual cortex of, of adult mice. So this shows that these kinds of programs are present in data that have not been uh, experimentally treated and make me think that you, know, you should uh, use the method to try to find other activity programs of interest in, in uh, other data sets. Um, what you can do when you know that this program is present in those cells is you can actually look for each cell type what fraction of the cells are expressing this program. So what fraction of excitatory layer two cells uh, have induced this late response program right? and, and have, you know, have received a sufficient visual stimulus to do that. And it was kind of surprising uh, to see that 40% you know, of the layer two cells were uh, expressing this gene expression program uh, down to a much smaller amount. But this actually matches the pattern of the cell types that we saw in the primary data set two, which is kind of compelling. But I should actually mention that in this particular case, there is a known artifact that is partially responsible for this. Uh, it turns out that when you dissociate neurons, it causes a gene expression program induction that's kind of similar to the, the induction they get from being stimulated multiple times. So that's actually a caveat that these uh, percentages are probably overinflated due to that. But nevertheless, there's still a, an important signal of variation in that data set, and uh, the fact that we we're able to find them was, was really cool. Um, so lastly, I'm just going to talk a little bit about one of the other activity programs that we identified uh, because, uh, you know, it's important to find some novel things. Um, this is a TSNE plot where the cells are colored by their usage of this other activity program, and uh, the cells are kind of spread out over multiple clusters. So this corresponds to saying that many different types of neurons are expressing the same program. And I'm showing on the left here uh, the top 10 genes that were associated, uh, that were enriched in the program. Um, and turns out that many of them have a published link to synapse formation. So for example, MEF2C, which was the top associated gene, is a transcription factor uh, whose targets have been associated with neuronal activity dependent uh, site selection. Uh, and in knockouts of this gene, uh, there was really significant uh, decrease in synaptic formation and synapse activity uh, that led to uh, you know, schizophrenia-like phenotypes. And now people are thinking that schizophrenia is a disease that's related to uh, in, uh, you know, abnormal pruning of dendrites in the neurons. So that's really con uh, consistent with this. Uh, and so MFTC is, is labeled as like a negative regulator of, of synapse numbers and function. Uh, NCAM1 and, and CADAM1, which is also known as SYNCAM, uh, are actually uh, synaptic adhesion molecules. So they cause the presynaptic and the postsynaptic cells to, to adhere to each other. And uh, when you knock them out, uh, when you knock out SYNCAM, for example, it, it leads to really abnormal synapse formations in mice. Uh, and similarly, uh, NCAM is really important for form, is required for functional synapse formation. So it's consistent as well with this kind of story. Uh, another kind of, uh, some other genes in here, so one of them is actin. And it turns out that actin provides the cytoskeleton uh, for synapses. And so it really made a lot of sense that that should be induced in a program that was causing <laughs> synapse formation. And bicolal one is a, uh, motor, is a component of the motor complex that actually takes signals from out here, uh, loads them into uh, to vesicles that are carried back to the, to, the, uh, to the cell body. So it's consistent that you would expect that program to be induced in, in, uh, in cells that are forming new synapses. Um, there are other, uh, other genes also make sense for this. Uh, for example, uh, H2Q4 is a uh, uh, MHC class one gene. And it's been recently shown that uh, the MHC class one is really important for synaptic plasticity and regeneration of neurons. Uh, so I just wanna tell you some conclusions uh, before wrapping up here. 
uh, activity programs are not just artifacts. I mean, some of them are, like cell cycle. And you know, for in the case of cell cycle, we know about it, so you can just regress it out. But activity programs can be really interesting, and they can be primary features of the data. And you can actually discover them from single cell RNA seq data using these kinds of a method. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, the method I described, the consensus factorization approach, can actually improve uh, the inference of this by increasing the robustness of the result. Uh, and so that increased accuracy in simulated data, and it increases interpretability on the whole because you get a consistent solution rather than different ones every time you run it. Uh, CNMF found expected identity and activity programs that can kind of serve as a positive control, but it also found unexpected and intriguing new programs that, uh, uh, you know, so I also just want to mention that it is not prohibitively costly to run. So all of these methods like NMF, ICA, and LDA are linear in the number of cells. Uh, and so, you know, and they can also be parallelized over multiple machines, and they can also be parallelized over cores. So it, you know, uh, half the time to run it if you run it on eight cores versus four cores. And uh, yeah, and there's also the code is available to run this is on GitHub, and there's a preprint on the bioarchive. Um, so I just want to say thank you to everyone, uh, again, especially to Adrian, my co-author in this work, the Sabeti Lab. We make funny holiday cards every year. Uh, yeah, and that is basically it.